podcasters, propaganda, and political vision. Oh, propaganda. Oh, oh, so much propaganda. What are we going to do about this? If you're somebody that's like, dude, John, I don't want to be about politics. I just want to be about the gospel. Hey, I feel you. Honestly, honestly, me too. I feel you. John, I don't want to talk about oh, propaganda, the media. I feel you. I wish we were living in a time where we didn't have to talk about any of that stuff and we could just talk about the goodness of God. But what if there is so much propaganda that it changes the way that you think and then you think you are not being political, but in the end, it's just because you're swimming in so much propaganda, it actually has changed the way that you think. What happened? Is that possible? Oh, let me think. Is that possible? Uh, yes. We're going to jump into it right here on a sweet episode of Koopa Stuff. Hey everybody, welcome back to Cooper Stuff. I hope you guys are doing good. I hope that you are having so far a good 2024, getting time with your family. I hope, loving Jesus, I hope. I'll tell you what, I want to start all the time, as much as I can, I want to encourage you in your faith. If you are feeling hopeless, I want to remind you that your hope is not in America, your hope is not in politics, your uh, hope is not in regaining back the culture. Yes, we want to regain back the culture. Yes, we want to see peace. All right, we want to see order. Yeah, we want to see life. Yeah, we hate what we're seeing. Your hope is not in those things. Your hope is in Jesus Christ. He has given you everything you need for life and godliness. Who knows? Maybe that'll be like a, a scripture of the year for me because so far I've talked about it every week. Why do I talk about it every week? Well, number one, because I want to remind you, I want to help you guys have a little bit of hope. Number two, because uh, I feel a bit hopeless. <laughs> Can I admit it to you guys? Struggling. It's been a dark season. Already been a dark season. It's has been a tough time. What I'm trying to say is this. I feel you. It does seem like a hopeless time. It does seem like an incredibly godless time. What I know for sure is this. We have everything we need for life and godliness in Jesus Christ. He is the hope. And no matter what happens in politics, it cannot fix it. We have a deep rot. So guess what? Whoever you want to win... The next election, on either side of anything, even if you get everything you ever wished for, ever, it will not save us. There's a hole that can only be filled with Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ will give us hope. Jesus Christ will give us peace and order. We have a moral rot that is not going to be able to be fixed. If you don't know Jesus, then I want you to know this. That hopelessness that you that you feel, that will not be filled with any politics. That will not be filled with any leader. It doesn't matter who gets in office. You can say, see, now the so-and-so is better, whatever. Pick your issue. I don't care. The economy is better now. Yeah, but there's still all these other things, and all these other things are really bad. And then you go fix the other things. (laughs) But look at it now. We fix that. But now the economy is terrible, and this, and my kids are coming home learning gender theory. It doesn't matter. Nothing is going to be perfect. That's just the way it is. That's life. The hope that you are looking for can only be found in a right relationship with your Creator, In Jesus Christ, his death, his resurrection made a way for that to be possible. So my encouragement to you, get to know Jesus, repent for your sin, ask for forgiveness. I want to change my mind. I changed my mind. I don't want to live the way I was living. I want to live the way you tell me to live according to your word, God. Your life will change so miraculously. You'll find yourself so full of hope that all this insanity happening in the world won't bother you in the same way. But yes, there will be times when it will bother you because you see it and your heart is broken. But it's not you're not going to try to find all of your hope through fixing politics because it's never going to happen. It's not a thing. So as we start this episode today, propaganda, we're going to talk about propaganda. The pastors, we're talking about this idea about this. Should pastors even be political? Is that just something they should not do? There's a lot of caveats I have for this, and we don't have time to get into all the caveats. But I under, here's, here's what I understand. If somebody says this, John, I just don't think pastors should waste their time studying political philosophy. They are supposed to be studying the Word of God and to rightly divide the Word, share the gospel, preach discipleship, to, to, you know, teach discipleship what it means to follow Jesus in every area of life according to the Word of God. They don't need politics for that. I actually, I hear you. I actually really, really, really hear you. There's something about that that I actually love. And I'll tell you what I don't want. I don't want church on Sunday 
to be a MAGA rally, okay? <laughs> so if what you're saying when you say that they shouldn't get political is you're you're thinking that it's going to be a rally for the GOP or for the DNC. I, I don't want that. Now, in this country, it's accepted for that to be done on the left, but if it's on the right, they call it Christian nationalism. It happens on the left, they just call that, you know, uh, living the true faith, applying the, the gospel to politics. If it's on the right, they call it Christian nationalism. Well, here's the thing. I don't want political rallies like that anyway. That's not what Sunday morning's about. That's not what the church is about. So, you know, if somebody's confused um, Christianity with, like, following Trump or something like that, of course we don't do that. That's, it's, that's not a thing. So I think that some of it is actually semantic. So I do understand what people say. It sounds very pious to say, I don't think our pastors need to understand political philosophy. This and that. But I think that when people say that, it's coming with certain assumptions. Or it's a baseline assumptions of, of, of worldview and what the, what the Bible you know, teaches a, a, about that sort of worldview. And the idea that somebody is just like completely free of any bias and any presuppositions. And is that actually a thing that can happen? So I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I want you to watch this 90-second video I made that's going to kind of explain a little bit why I don't really understand the idea of churches not talking about politics. Not talk, because politics is nothing more than morality applied, and I think the Bible teaches us about morality. This is going to also share about my book. So it's a 90-second clip. Watch this video. Don't you know Christians shouldn't be political? I hear that said to me a hundred times a day. Many Christian leaders won't dare say anything positive about America or the West to the point that they won't even teach principles of liberty. They act as if freedom from tyranny is just a given rather than something that has been fought for, bled for, and worth preserving. In fact, they sometimes act as if preserving freedom is akin to being selfish. And since Christ calls us to give up our lives for his sake, that we can't try to hold on to the benefits of our republic, but is that true? Our leaders won't whisper anything good about America because it could seem idolatrous or because it makes the kingdom too political. But have you noticed they don't mind speaking of all the bad things America has done? Apparently, that's just keeping it real. In my opinion, if they want to keep it real, they should tell all of history, good, the bad, and the ugly. But why is this? I believe that they have swallowed the narrative of this age of oppressors and oppressed groups. And the righteous thing to do is to always speak up for the perceived victim groups. And as you know, America is said to be the oppressor. The question I have for these leaders is this, what do you think will replace American democracy after the secular progressive revolution? And will we be more free or less free to live out our faith to preach the gospel, to raise our children. We all know the answer is that we will be less free. Then I ask this, why do you think it's more pious to remain silent while the world burns? For the answer to this question and what we can do about it, you need to go get my new book, Wimpy, Weak, and Woke. Do it now at johnlcooper.com. So there you go. Go get the book, johnlcooper.com. I think you're going to like it. It's right here. This is what it looks like. It's beautiful. All right, so we're going to jump into this, this idea about propaganda. I'm, I'm, I got a lot to weave into this. This idea about getting political. I, I'm going to be totally honest with you. Some of you are going to disagree with me. Send me a comment. We're still friends. If you disagree, this is a sort of like this is a conversation. It's me being real, all right? I wish, <laughs> I wish to God, I wish to God that we could go back to a time when everybody in America had a sort of similar baseline about worldview. And now I realize there were always going to be people on the right and the left, Christians and non-Christians. I'm not saying that even then it wasn't important for some people to speak about politics. I'm sorry, Christian people to speak about politics. I, I actually think it is. I think it was very important to, to decide. I wish we could go back to a time when normal people, right, this is, People with kids, people that are just like, I just wanted to kind of like, like teach my kids school and like have a job and live for Jesus and tell my friends about Jesus. And yeah, I kind of want to go back to that. That's just not the America we're living in. So it's kind of impossible. It's kind of impossible to escape this situation when you're just like, hey, I, I thought this is America. I thought we all kind of like agreed that like, for instance, my, my kids shouldn't go to school and like a drag queen comes in and reads stories to them about, you know, transgender identities or something like that and tells them it's really good to for boys to be gender fluid. 
can we go back to a time when we do that? Because the minute I come on to Cooper stuff and say, what I just said, we should have drag queens reading to our kids. Boom! Why are you getting political? You're being divisive. You're being mean. All these things hit. It's kind of impossible to not be political in that sense. So, yeah, I wish we could go back to that time. I really do. So normal people could just get on with their lives and say, we kind of agree. We have some commonalities in this country of things that we kind of agree are, are good and bad. Some of those people, we agree on kind of good and bad but some of those people don't recognize that Jesus is Lord. I wish they would. And But we agree on morality, so they're not constantly looking at me like I'm a bad person because I'm a, G, uh, I'm a Jesus freak. And I follow the Word of God. They don't go, yeah, John's just, well, he's, he's actually kind of a, 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 you know, an evil, mean, um, intolerant, bigoted, fill-in-the-blank phobe. You know what I'm saying? He's kind of that way because he's one of those Christians, and Christianity is sort of inherently oppressive. We were living in that time. L let me read you something from my book. This is just a quote from the great Billy Graham. Would you guys agree with me and say that Billy Graham was one of these guys when they're like, you know how you hear people say, you just got to keep it about the gospel. Don't get involved in politics. Do you guys agree that Billy Graham was sort of like, pretty like gospel beast? He was a gospel beast if there, if there, I mean, if there ever was in our lifetime. It was Billy Graham. Do we have agreement on that? Here's what Billy Graham, the guy who kept it about the gospel, said. This is roughly around 1960, I believe. Here's what he says. And it's, I'm, reading, I'm reading this from my book. Let's look at the words of the most influential evangelist in modern American history, Billy Graham, who is known for keeping his message centered on the gospel. He saw communism as a worldwide threat to the gospel and to humanity. Now, that's really important. We're going to get back to that humanity thing in a second. Regarding this battle, he warned, quote, either communism must die or Christianity must die. Why are you getting political, Billy Graham? You got to keep it about the gospel. He's like, he's the gospel beast. We should write a song. Uh, hey, yeah, I'm the one that you wanted. Billy Graham is a gospel beast. Anyway, I don't know. Or maybe that even sounds, I'm not really sure, but I like it. And anyway, let's move on. Billy Graham is all about the gospel. And he's like, hey, FYI, FYI, not getting political, but either communism will die or Christianity will die. It's one or the other. You can't, you can't have both these things living at the same time. It's like, it's like Harry Potter and Voldemort. Uh, neither can live, while, neither can exist while the, while the other lives. And um, for anybody who, who cares about that, weird pop culture references time, okay? Um, you, you can't have both of them. Let's keep going, because he, 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 he gets a little extra here. And then I write, he understood the religious nature of Marxism, even rhetorically asking, quote, has it ever occurred to you that the devil is a religious leader and millions are worshiping at his shrine today? Billy Graham continues, the name of this present day religion is communism. The devil is their God, Marx their prophet. These diabolically inspired men seek in devious and various ways to convert a peaceful world to their doctrine of death and destruction. And then I write, he then left us with a binary choice. No nuance, no caveats, no apologies. Will we be led, this, and this is Billy Graham, quote, will we be led by Jehovah God or duped by Satan? The battle lines are clearly drawn. Billy Graham, why are you getting so divisive and so political? Are you a Christian nationalist? When we talk about whether pastors should get political or not, th there's a lot of semantics of what we mean. And I think a, a great example is this. Do you believe that it is okay for pastors to, um, and I'm, I've already told you, I am not suggesting that I want pastors to become political activists for the GOP. Are you kidding me? No, I do not. I've already told you, the GOP is going to lead us to hell. Just not as fast, in my opinion, as the DNC. But, but the GOP is not submitted to the Lord Jesus Christ. We're talking about some, some people that do a lot of nasty stuff. A lot of diabolical things happen. I don't want to see Sunday morning be a GOP rally. I don't want that for any political candidate. I don't think it's good. But should we be talking about moral issues? Should we be saying, hey... Whether we're talking about abortion, we're, we're talking about the insanity of the gender confusion happening in our schools to our kids, to the public defamation and blasphemous displays against Christianity. And you notice they're only against Christianity. There's not blasphemous displays against Allah. 
There's not, you know, uh, meaning, the, meaning Islam. There's not blasphemous displays against other religions. But, they, but, but it's okay to have a blasphemous display against Christianity because Christianity are the oppressors. So I'm not saying I want some sort of, don't, do, do not send me a t- tweet or a comment and be like, oh, you're, you're MAGA. Um, I don't want a MAGA rally on a Sunday. Trump is not the prophet of God. America is not the new Israel. We're not saying that. But we are saying, do we need to care about moral issues? Billy Graham understood it. You can either have communism or this. So the question is this. Is it right for pastors to understand the times? Or at least, you see, I'm actually a really gracious person. I don't even go as, to, as far as to say every pastor must understand the times in that way. I don't even go that far. Because I do have a caveat that there are some pastors that are like, John, I just don't feel called to understand all those things. All that I do is I exegete the passages of Scripture. That's all that I do. They can apply it to the culture. I don't watch the news. I don't know anything going on. I live in a cave. I exegete the Scriptures. That is my calling, and I do not want to get involved in all this stuff about abortion. And I don't want to do that. Now, if he actually does that as he's exegeting Scriptures, it just makes sense that a lot of those you will be able to make um, um, you'll be able to, to take the moral applications and be like, well, obviously that means these things. So I am giving you a caveat. Are there people like that? I've met some. I think they're really godly men. I'm not saying you're sinning by not doing it. I don't think everybody has to do that. But do I think that every church should have someone who understands the times? Absolutely. That's all I'm saying. Should they understand the times that we are living in? So that they can go, oh, wait a minute. I don't want to get political. This isn't about the GOP, please. Are you kidding me? I don't care about any of that stuff. I don't even care if you vote, but I do want you to know. <laughs> Actually, let's not say I don't care if you vote because uh, I think it's pretty important. I, I, I th- That's the line that I wouldn't say. But put, I'm, I'm exaggerating to make the point. They're saying, I, I'm not MAGA. I'm not even saying GOP. I'm not saying any of that. I'm just saying, hey, either communism or Christianity can live. They both can't live. They are religions opposed. Marxism is a religion opposing Christianity. They are two totalizing kingdoms. They cannot coexist. One of these things has got to go. Yes, I do think. We have to have that. Now, here's what I'm really concerned about. I'm going to read a scripture to you in one second. Here's what I'm really concerned about and what I personally think is happening. In a, in, in a, in a uh, what do you call it, an attempt to not be political, what you end up having are, and, and I don't want to be rude when I say men who don't understand the times, but maybe, I don't know if they understand the times or not. To my mind, they don't seem to understand the times, okay? But that's what it is. All right, church leaders, Sorry. But they will say, because we're not going to get political, I am here to teach the Word of God. I'm not here to do those things. I'm just going to teach the Word of God, and we'll talk about morality and this and that. Well, here's what I'm concerned that's happening, what I actually believe is happening. What if, now stay with me, stay with me. What if, I know I'm going out on a ledge here, not really, but what if, <laughs> what if, what if I, that was an old Creed song, don't worry about it. What if, anyway, um, what if this, what if, A church leader thinks that he is not being political at all. He's like, hey, I'm not even like watching the news. I don't get involved in this. I don't get involved in any of those. I don't really care. I'm not political. I never want to talk about politics. But what if he doesn't know that he is actually so suckered in to the propaganda of the day that he is taking he is taking the word. You see, he's taking the word of people, big media big tech, et cetera. He's taken their word on what is actually happening in the world. He doesn't want to get involved, but he's going, well, yeah, but everybody knows, everybody knows A, B, or C because of the propaganda of the time we're living in. And because of that, he says, guys, I'm not getting political, but I am saying, if you want to be a good Christian, you really should do X, Y, and Z because that's what it means to be a light. Now, he thinks he's not being political. He's just applying morality to the situation. Can I give you an example up in here? It's not a hypothetical. What if somebody is so suckered into the propaganda of the day? Woo, we're about to get busy now, son. Now's when we're about to, we're about to light it up. Uh, light it up, up, up. You see, it's a singing day, apparently. I don't want music's in my head. I'm in the process of writing music right now. Um, he's so propagated that he goes, well, hey, I don't get political, but everybody knows. Everybody knows. The COVID's going around. 
And the only way to stop it is to get the jab. It's the only way to do it. And there's a lot of people out there saying that, that you shouldn't get the jab or that you don't need it if you're young or if you're a kid or if you're healthy or if you've already had COVID. But those people are spreading disinformation and a true Christian would never spread disinformation. A true Christian would never lie to his friends. A true Christian would never put other lives in danger, killing your grandmother because you're so selfish and you're so political because politics is your God that you're not getting the jab. Does that? I mean, I know I sound a little crazy up in here, up in here, up in here. Does that sound a little bit familiar to anybody? Because it does to me. I'm not being political. I'm not being political. I don't get involved in politics. I'm just saying, obviously, guys, the only way to stop the spread is for everybody to get the jab. That's the Christian thing to do. Does this make sense to you guys? So what I'm saying is this. Am I gracious? I think I'm gracious. I'm carving out a caveat to where I say I have met godly men who say I don't want to get involved in politics. I'm never going to speak about it, and I don't even really care, and that's not my job. I'm here to exegete Scripture. I don't have time to study political vision. Am I carving out a slot and saying I do think that there are some of those people? Yes, I am. I do not have any I, – I, I don't dislike them. Here's what I'm saying. I think that for a lot of – some of them, caveats. Some of them, I'm watching my words today, some of them think that they don't have any political vision, but they actually do because they're suckered by the propaganda of the day. You have to have a, enough of political, under, uh, political vision, political philosophy, enough or at least a great biblical worldview to understand the sort of thing that the Bible teaches and the things that the Bible don't teach. And so what happened now, am I saying that you have to have other books besides the Bible to know that? I'm actually not. I'm actually not. But what happens, I think, more times than not, is they go, I'm just biblical. I'm not looking at anything else. But what happens when, now listen to me, what happens when this? When big media, all of big tech, big corporations, you've seen it with Disney, uh, Bud Light, as you know, the, and, and all these campaigns that have gone completely woke, they are putting all of their money towards a certain agenda. Do you agree with that? Cor corporations, um, their, their ESG scores and all these this kind of environmental social governance, it's called. All these scores and things are based on progressive ideologies that they are instituting in their companies, whether it is um, trans policies and pro-BLM and pro-LGBT and, and climate initiatives and woke stuff. And the more of that they put into their companies, the more of these, they, these higher ratings they get with these ESG scores – and so the higher ratings they get, it pushes out companies that do not do the woke stuff. So companies then have to implement woke stuff and, and, and pro-LGBT stuff and pro-BLM stuff and pro-social justice so that they get a better score or else their business is going to suffer. That's why all the businesses have gone woke. So you've got big tech, you've got big media, you've got big business, all the corporations, we call it corporatism sometimes, you've got the White House joining in in the propaganda to silence certain voices on social media. We know that for a fact now. We always knew it. There was always proof, but now we know it for a fact because it's actually come out in Congress under oath. So we know that that was true. And now you have a politicized court system. You've got politicized teachers' unions for K-12. through You've got po politicized um, universities. Every single institution in the nation is all forced one way that can only give you one side and they silence any voices against it. So what do you have when you have that? The milieu, what a great word, milieu. I would say, what do you call it? The vibe, the culture you grow up in all says these things are normal and these other things are not. And so you can, you can act like you're not being political all you want to. But every single force in the nation, in the culture, your friends, your friends' Facebook pages, your friends' social media, your kids' schooling, even, oh, wait for it, even the Christian private schools. I know this for a fact. I'm all about the private school. I'm actually all about homeschool. But Christian private school is, is an alternative. Christian a classical education, a great alternative. Love it. I very much believe in it. Actually, I 100% believe in it. But those are also getting the woke stuff into them. 
And you have to be absolutely hypervigilant to get this stuff out, to pay attention because it's coming from Christian people. Why? Because the entire milieu, the entire vibe, the entire culture is cramming it down the throats saying, this is what's normal. And before you know it, you've become a propaganda machine saying that you're not political because you're all about the word of God. Do you see what I'm saying? You just might actually be political. I want to read you a Bible verse, and then I'm going to share with you a couple of things happening so you see, oh, that's what John's talking about, and I hope it encourages you. I want to read this. A lot of people know this. This is from 1 Chronicles chapter 12. Can we go down to verse 23? Are you ready? 23, these are the numbers of the men armed for battle who came to David at Hebron to turn Saul's kingdom over to him as the Lord had said. So here's all the numbers of the men from all the tribes. Okay, you have 12 tribes, right? So here's what they do. From Judah, carrying shield and spear, 6,000 armed for battle. So you have people from Judah, they're carrying shield and spear. Uh, People from Simeon, warriors ready for battle. From Levi, including blah, 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 a brave young warrior with 22 officers from his family. You have Benjamin, which is Saul's tribe, 3,000, most whom had remained uh, loyal to Saul's house. So you have all these people coming, blah, blah, blah. We're moving all the way down to verse 32. From Issachar, men who understood the times and knew what Israel should do. I want you to hear that. Men who understood. We, we've got men with sword and shields. We have warriors coming down. We have these other people coming down. We have brave warriors coming down. And then we have those men from there. They are men who understood the times and they knew what Israel should do. Now, this reminds some people have different uh, interpretations of what understood the times mean. I have always understood that as these are men who had wisdom. They understood the times they were living in. They, they, they knew what time it was. That might be our language. Like, oh, yeah, the, oh, yeah, yeah, that guy totally gets it. You know what I'm saying? So, so maybe he's not the best. Maybe he's not the best preacher in the whole world. Maybe he's not the best like biblical exegete ever. But that guy gets it. He knows what time it is. He sees what the enemy forces are doing. He sees what they're doing. He understands the time. He understands the politics of it. He understands the religious implications of it. Now you have to understand too. It's in biblical times, of course, Old Testament times. These the people of God were constantly. Under, un, under fire from other, uh, other, other nations, other uh, eth- uh, ethnic groups with their own gods. And so what, what God in the Old Testament is constantly, Yahweh, God is constantly telling his people, do not take in those other gods. You defeat that other, that other group of people. You do not worship their gods. When you defeat them, you defeat their God. Do you see what I'm saying? So it is very much like no separation between church and state, you might want to say, in terms of ideology. You are the nation of Israel. That is a, 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 a religious nation. That is also a political nation. God is the head of Israel. So you go in there. You're going to defeat these other armies. Those other armies, they have different gods. They are coming to you in the name of Baal. They're coming to you in the name of whatever their gods are. They're coming to you... But but we are going to them, not in my own name, but in the name of the Lord who saves Yahweh, Jehovah. We're coming in the name of the living God against you and your gods. We're going to defeat you, which means we're defeating your God. And of course, it is actually our God who's defeating your God, proving that our God is, there's no one like Yahweh. There's no one as powerful as Yahweh. There's no one as just as Yahweh. He reigns over everything. Your gods bow down to my God up in this peace. Glory, hallelujah, don't shout me down because I'm preaching real good. And our God's going to show your, your God's who's boss. But then he's telling Israel, when you do that, you do not bring their gods into your worship to me. And as we see through all the Old Testament, of course they did, which is really sad. And they bring these things together. Could it be that these men of Issachar, men who understood the times and knew what they should do, understood what the battle was about, understood how those gods are coming against ours. I think today it doesn't seem a leap if I've understood the Bible correctly. If you disagree, send me a comment. No problem. But I, this is what I've understood it to mean. People who understand the times, they see the ideologies coming in to pervert the church. It's like Billy Graham. Billy Graham saying, hey, I'm all about the gospel. I don't want to be about politics. But only communism or Christianity can survive. Not both. Because it's coming against the living God. 
He was a man who understood the times. He saw what was, he knew what time it was, bro. Do you know what time it, what I'm, I'm not saying that every single pastor needs to be like this. I gave you my caveat because I'm a super gracious person. But you need someone at your church who understands the times. Or you just might end up including the worship of other gods into your faith. Do you see what I'm saying? Sort of like the Old Testament. You may end up including, well, what do you mean by worship other gods? Well, basically, you just might try to synthesize Christianity and Marxism. That could never happen. Hello, have you been paying attention since like 2019? Or maybe before, actually. Hit pretty hard in 2020, I'd say. Maybe there's a synthesis of, of worship that's happening. Maybe it's Christianity plus uh, you know, equity and inclusion and, and the sexual revolution. Have you seen that happening in churches? I want to read one more thing. We also see a similar language in the book of Esther, chapter 113. I'm going to read from the NIV for this just because it's here. Since it was customary for the king to consult experts in matters of law and justice, he spoke with the wise men who understood the times. So we need, we need people that can preach the word of God. I am not asking you to get political, but this idea that there can never be any political talk, and there's a semantical argument for that. I gave you a caveat for that. I also told you what I do not want. I don't want Sunday morning MAGA rallies, but I will say the idea of pastors and church leaders that don't understand the times in order to, to explain what law and justice would be, I, that just makes no sense to me. And if they and if they constantly say I'm not going to get into any of that stuff, they're running under a, into danger of letting the propaganda of the times change the way of what they think is normal. Does that make sense to you? How many conversa- I have this conversation once a month now. It's 2024, and I still have this conversation with church leaders who I love and who I respect. Still in 24. Tell me if, send me a comment and tell me if you agree. I'm just kind of curious what your experience is. I'm not trying to get you to yell about your pastor. I'm not telling you to be mean. Please, honest to God, I, I mean it. Give me a, a, give me a comment. Tell me if you agree or disagree, if you've experienced this. In 2024, godly men that I love and respect and I think are really wonderful, they still, to this day, <laughs> they still believe that like, like, uh, universal masking is a it, like worked. I mean, they still believe like no matter how many receipts I show them, they still believe it. They still believe that that the they still believe that the jab works and stuff like. I mean, I'm <laughs> I know I'm getting into dicey territory. I've never told anybody not to get the jab. I'm just saying. I, I've always said. You know what? I've always said. Pray about it. Issue of conscience. Hey, if I was 70 or 80 years old and I thought, you know, in the short term, this may help, even if long term, whatever it may be, I understand that. But hey, if you're young, you're healthy and this, and I, I, I don't think that I need it. You do whatever you want to do. I still talk to church leaders who, have, who are like, yeah, I hear what you're saying. I, I don't think they think I'm spreading propaganda to this day. Tell me if you've experienced that. I'm, I'm a little blown away by it. So let me give you some examples of just things that are just happened literally like in the last week. All right, here's one thing that I want to share because this is what I think. Well, actually, let's let, let's start here. This isn't. <laughs> this is just so frustrating. I'm going to read this. this is from Newsweek because the other are some of the other articles I'm going to read are from Daily Wire. This is from Newsweek. Here's the title: Fauci gives Republicans ammo for lab leak quote conspiracy theory. It's just, see the way, the way that the culture turns everything. Uh, let me explain. Well, let me read it, and then I'll explain what I mean by this. It's just, uh, Dr. Oh, here we go. Dr. Anthony Fauci provided ammo to Republicans this week as he reportedly acknowledged that claims that the COVID-19 virus stemmed from a lab leak in Wuhan, China, was not a, quote, conspiracy theory. Fauci's testimony this week comes amid ongoing speculation among Republicans that COVID-19 originated from a lab leak in Wuhan, China. From an ongoing speculation. I mean, it's just, it's, all right. Anyway, from an ongoing speculation, you can just, you can hear it in the article. The U.S. Department of Energy previously determined with a low confidence rating that the virus likely originated from a lab leak, the Wall Street Journal previously reported. Over this past week, Fauci, the former chief medical advisor to the White House, appeared before the Republican-led House 
select subcommittee on the coronavirus pandemic to testify about the origins of COVID-19 and how different health agencies across the nation responded to the pandemic. He testified that the lab leak hypothesis, which was often suppressed, was, in fact, not a conspiracy theory, committee chairman Representative Brad Winstrup said. (laughs) It's 2024. (laughs) You know what I mean? It's like, give him a slow clap. Hey. Thank you. Thank you for being honest. It's 2024. You're years late. This is insane. All right. So this just happened. We're talking about in the last like eight days. Okay, guys, or nine days. The statement also included key takeaways from Fauci's closed-door testimony, which said, Dr. Fauci acknowledged that the lab leak hypothesis is not a conspiracy theory. This comes nearly four years after prompting the publication of the now infamous Proximal uh, proximal Origin paper that attempted to vilify and disprove the lab leak hypothesis. So here's the thing. It's not just that he said back then, no, it's not probable. They wanted to vilify it. In other words, they were mounting a propaganda campaign And calling us spreading propaganda from saying something that was more than likely obvious that like everybody's like, oh, yeah, that well, that kind of makes a lot more sense than what they're saying. Even then, there was evidence coming out to support. It wasn't just people going, well, common sense, of course, duh. Yes, it was common sense. Everybody kind of went, oh, yeah, okay, I get that. Most everybody. They even had evidence supporting it, but they were still calling us propaganda whilst they were doing a propaganda campaign to intentionally vilify people who said it. Guess who else did the exact same thing? Big Eva, the big evangelical world, our institutional leadership, Russell Moore, who used to be the head of the Southern Baptist Convention's ERLC, um, David French. That list is really, really big of the people that came on and vilified us. Dr. Francis Collin, who is the head of the NIH under Fauci, who was supposedly an evangelical Christian. Dr. Collins appeared with Russell Moore, one of the leading, most influential uh, evangelicals in America now, and called people like me, basically John Cooper and people like Cooper stuff, if you believe in the lab leak theory, you do. You are breaking the law of Jesus to love your neighbor as yourself because you're spreading a lie. You are hurting people. You are causing people to die. You are spreading misinformation. You're being a bad Christian. Why? Because they believe the propaganda and called us propagandists. They're saying, hey, we're above politics. Russell Moore is constantly talking about how he is above politics. Like, I'm not saying that he's a wolf in sheep's clothing. I'm not saying he's not a brother in Christ. I don't know Russell Moore. I don't hate Russell Moore. I would have a conversation with him, and I would treat him as a fellow Christian because I don't know his heart before the Lord. So don't don't think I'm saying I hate this guy and I want to create a war. He's the one creating a war by saying when we said what was obviously true and is pretty much, I think, even Dr. Fauci is like, okay, okay, this is a chance that this is right. After they vilified us, You see what I'm saying? It's like they're the ones doing the propaganda, saying they're not being political, calling us political. Well, I think that we need men who understand the times. And part of understanding the times is looking at people like Francis Collins, Dr. Collins, and frankly, Russell Moore, and say, you guys are bringing something. You are believing propaganda. You are doing something really bad. And it could lead, it could lead to an incredibly tyrannical totalitarian state and I don't want to get political but like Billy Graham said communism Marxism collectivism giving the state all consuming supreme power so that you can no longer make decisions about you know certain things jabs that you put in your body and or about your children they're trying to mandate this stuff for little kids and saying if you did it do it then you're not showing that you love your neighbor I think that it's the Christian thing to say, hey, I don't want to get political either. But you can either choose Christianity or, or communism, like Billy Graham said. You got to choose one or the other. I'm, I'm not really into the all-powerful state. <laughs> Are you? I think the only question, that's what I'm going to ask Russell Moore. I'd say, Russell, do you agree that slavery was wrong and the Christian thing to do would have been to speak out against slavery? Of course he'd say, yeah, because he's hyper-woke. 
you know, and, and, and then I'd say, are you saying, are you a racist? And then it, that'd be the worst thing you could ever call somebody like a woke person like Russell Moore. Of course he would say, of, of course it's the Christian thing to do. Well, that's what we're doing to you, bro. You're, you've swallowed the propaganda machine and that's what we're doing to you because we're men who understand the times. All right. Now let's keep reading this. Um, blah, 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 blah. I'm only saying this because the end of this, you gotta, you gotta hear, uh, where is it? Where is it? Fauci. This is a quote from Dr. Fauci at the end of this article. You have to look at the data. I don't see any data for a lab leak. This is what he said in 22. That doesn't mean it could not have happened. Now this is in 22 when he was finally saying it, it, there's no way it happened, but blah, blah, blah. And he goes, and that's the reason I keep an open mind always about that. Uh, Fauci said during an interview with Boston Globe in 2023. Sorry, that was in February 23. So that's when he went from the, you know, th this is, you know, there's no way this happened. All these people are spreading propaganda. Last February 23, so it's about almost a year ago. He's like, okay, I'm not saying it couldn't happen. I'm saying there's still nothing to prove that. He was, of course, not, I think, not being honest. And then uh, the, the last thing I want to read from here is really funny. Hold on. Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Oh, here you go. Um, Previously, Dr. Fauci advocated that when you make it difficult for people in their lives, this is a quote, they lose their ideological, and then he uses the word BS, okay? So he said, <laughs> previously, Dr. Fauci advocated, quote, that when you make it difficult for people in their lives, they lose their ideological junk, you know, BS, he says, then they get vaccinated. That's the statement. So back then he was saying, hey, we're going to make them lose. We're going to make their lives difficult. We're going to mandate this thing. We're going to mandate the jab. We're going to say that if you're saying that all this stuff isn't true, then you're spreading propaganda. We're going to vilify you. I'm going to get Christians like Dr. Collins. And, and at the time, I think he even had Tim Keller on the show. Tim Keller also with him at that point. Um, and people like David French, Russell Moore. These are all people that jumped on board with that. If you don't do this, you're not loving your neighbor campaign. And so we're going to make your life difficult until you do it. All I'm asking is this. I don't want, I'm not saying pastors need, get, pastors need to get political. Would it be good for a pastor to have enough political understanding of the times that they go, all right, wait a minute, wait a minute. It is not actually right for you guys to become tyrannical and to try to make all of American citizens slaves to your ideolog ide ideological uh, prerogatives. That is not a good thing to do. Let's read a couple of other things that have happened because it's actually kind of quite amazing. This one, you guys, I'm, I'm actually going to play the video because this is just so absolutely disgusting. So Trump won the Iowa caucus thing that happened just last week, right? Joy Reid on MSNBC is basically saying this is the problem. The reason that this happened is because because of white Christians. And then she starts saying a bunch of things that she thinks what white Christians are all about. It's actually just better if you hear the video for yourself. Speaking of propaganda, and then I'll give my two cents. Watch this video. But, you know, I feel like the, the important sort of data point, and, and, you know, Steve talks about it a lot. He's, he's going to probably talk about it a little more tonight, is that these, these are white Christians. That this is a state that is overrepresented, overrepresented by white Christians that are going to participate in these tonight. caucuses, yes. especially tonight. Um, I today, earlier today, reached out to Robert Jones, Robbie Jones, um, from the Public Religion Research Institute, knowing that we were going to talk about Iowa. And this is a hyper evangelical st white state. And he said the following to me Iowa is about 61% white Christian. The country as a whole is approximately 41% white Christian. And in Iowa, we're talking about evangelical white Christians. And he said the following. Because I asked him, what do they get out of supporting Donald Trump? Because he keeps losing, he keeps delivering losses and losses and losses. And he said the following, they see themselves as the rightful inheritors of this country. And Trump has promised to give it yeah. back to them. All the things that we think about, about electability, about, you know, what are people gaming out or mm -hmm. none of that matters when you believe that God has given you this country, that it is yours and that everyone who is not a white conservative Christian is a is a fraudulent American, is a less, a less, a less real American. I've spent a lot of time on this show teaching uh, to teaching some of you guys or, or sharing with you guys about what people mean when they say Christian nationalism, what they mean when they say, quote, Western Christianity, when they say white evangelicalism, when they say, uh, I can't even think of any other words right now. All these words to them mean the same thing. And this is why it is so confusing when, when they say things like, well, white evangelical do this. 
uh, the black church does this. The white church. This is why all of these word games have got to be defined. It's very confusing. But this is the propaganda happening. Now, I shared with you guys a few years ago, people like Beth Moore completely swallowed this narrative. The narrative is this. Historic, what, what we call historical Christianity is not actually true Christianity. So, so people like you, you might be watching this, and I say, hey, guys, um, the historic church, the creeds of the church, the Reformation, all right, so I'm talking about Luther, Calvin, uh, the Reformation folks, or even the early church fathers. You can even go back that far if you really want to. Um, Irenaeus and these people like that, uh, uh, Augustine or Augustine, people call him the smart people. Augustine, I like to say because I'm a redneck. It reminds me of St. Augustine in Florida. Um, Augustine, these people, these church fathers, basically what they're saying is this. True Christianity was distorted nearly from the beginning, they say, and it keeps getting more perverted and more perverted and more perverted. The, um, Catholicism pervert, perverted the faith and made it even more nationalistic and militaristic. Then the Reformation came and made it an entirely different kind of militaristic. And then you had European white people that then went and spread in an imperialistic fashion around the whole world. They, they came to what is now America, the Americas. They spread around the world in colonialism and imperialism and spread a distorted version of Christianity that they call true Christianity. They call it the historic faith, orthodox Christianity. You can call it whatever you want to. The point Joy Reid's making is the same point that people like, you hear it sometimes in a light version from Phil Vischer or um, Jamar Tisby, who wrote Woke Church. You hear the light version of that coming from those kind of folks. You hear a heavier version of that coming from people like Anthea Butler and in some of these people they have on this new film coming out next month, uh, the film's called uh, Church and State or something. I can't remember what it's called. It's done by atheist Rob Reiner, who's a progressive leftist. Um, and he's got all these, Russell Moore, David French, Phil Vischer, all these people just beating up on Christian nationalism. They say Christian nationalism is the biggest threat to America. Well, what do they mean by Christian nationalism? They mean this distorted version of Christianity that is inherently racist. It is inherently bigoted towards anybody that is doesn't have white skin it is inherently bigoted towards anybody that was not born with white skin particularly particularly in this country meaning the actual soil of america we come here we're from here this is my land get off my property uh you know um get out with your your you shouldn't be mixing skin colors um we're better, you're more like animals than we are, you know, whatever kind of racist, scientific racism, or even just not even necessarily scientific racism, but just say, hey, fine, you're, you, we're not saying we're better than you, but we don't want you here. Go back to your country. That sort of like, this is our land and it belongs to white people and it belongs to the patriarchy and it belongs to people with trucks and guns. And if you're not like that, then you're not a true American and we want to kick you out. Meaning, we want to get guns, take over the White House, um, like actual militant revolution, and this co belongs to us. God, God gave us this land. This is our land. Sort of like God gave Israel to the nation of God kind of a thing. So th th that's what they say. It is a caricature of your typical uh, evangelical. Like, it's a total caricature I don't even know any. I don't know a single person that believes any of those things. Not saying they don't exist. They they do. There there are some crazies out here, but that's not what typical Christians believe. You know that's not even what they mean when they say, "Guys, we got to take this country back for God." They don't mean this militaristic forcing people to become Christians. What they mean is this: this country was born with an understanding that the Bible is good, and that it is good to honor God. And because of that, we were blessed, and we have now have a bunch of moral rot, and we need to go back. In other words, the hope for America is in what we used to have in the past, meaning moral order, recognizing that evil things are evil and good, godly things are good, as opposed to trading evil for good and good for evil, which is the time we're in now. So this is a good example. So what happens if you're a, if you're a church leader who's like, I don't want to get involved in politics. I don't care about any of that stuff. And I don't even watch the news, blah, blah, blah. 
But what if you're like that? But every single thing you hear in culture from big tech, big media, big corporation, um, universities, even the Christian universities, you guys, I took, we took our son down to, to Wheaton. Uh, I think it was Wheaton, wasn't it? Whatever Bible college, we went to the Christian college to see what it was all about. It was so stinking woke. It was so disgustingly woke that I, I would never in a million years send my kid to that school. Uh, and, I, and I think it was Wheaton, and now I'm getting confused. Wh whatever school it was, it's the one that Billy Graham went to. And I think that is Wheaton. Look it up. So I'm more sure this one that Billy Graham went to than, than it was Wheaton. Go check it up. Um, so uh, anyway, there's that. And um, point being, even the Christian colleges are, are, are saying these kinds of things as the norm. So what happens if, as a church leader, you don't get involved in any of these things, but you start believing all this propaganda as it is, and so you start saying things that you don't think are political, but they actually are quite like political vision. Read you another, this is another article from Daily Wire. State Department paid Germans to bring censorship and propaganda to U.S. schools. Here's what it's called under the name media literacy. Do you see how this propaganda works? I don't want to get political. But our kids are just learning media literacy. Who doesn't want that? Well, yeah, but what if media literacy is actually nothing more than censorship against Christianity and censorship against uh, what we might call just like traditional conservatism in this country a against the idea that there are moral absolutes? The U.S. State Department paid for censorship practitioners from Germany. Who? This is the state. That means that our taxes are paying for this in, in schools in America. Paid for censorship practitioners from Germany, which does not enjoy the same freedoms as, as Americans do from the First Amendment, to train teachers in the United States how to police so-called disinformation, records show. The records unearthed through the Freedom of Information Act by the Media Research Center, that's MRC, found that the State Department paid for trainings that were created mostly by German disinformation activists, and that program was organized by an advocacy group that promotes similar laws in the United States while sharing top officials and finances with a for-profit and anti-disinformation firm that could profit from such laws. So, let me just kind of tell you what we're dealing with, and then I'll be done. What we're dealing with is this. For instance, in Germany, it, it is unlawful to homeschool your kids. You are not allowed. If you say, "Hey, I want to teach my own kids," well, you're, well you're, that's against the law. Your kids will be taken away from you. There will be civil penalties. Seriously, civil penalties. Your kids are taken away from you. Court filings. I, I don't. I don't know. I don't know if you go to jail. I don't know exactly what it is. But you don't get a slap on the wrist. You may not educate your own kids. Why? Because you can't be trusted to. That belongs to the state. Because we don't want you turning your kids into little extreme crazy pants to do something like World War II again. You see where we're going? We don't want you to turn into some kind of crazy, oh, we have our, our religion and now we're big stream. No, we don't want you to have some extreme religion. We need commonality. Well, what is commonality? The commonality is that love for the state. Do you see what I'm saying? Love for the state and the state will dictate what is extreme and what is not extreme. And so if you are teaching your kids that there are only two genders, then you are extreme. You are radical. You are one of those white Christians, those white evangelicals that believe this is our land and we got to go back to what you see what I'm saying. All of this is the same thing. And they just call it media literacy. I'm not saying that the pastors and preachers need to sit around reading headlines and understanding the ins and outs of propaganda. But what I see nine times out of 10, are people, are, are people that say, they say it to people like me, church leaders say to people like me, like, I, look, I, I, maybe they even say, I, I like what you do. I just, I would think I would want to do that. I, I think that some of the things you're getting into, John, like talking about the policing of speech, those are not Christian issues. And it just sounds like you're ranting. It just sounds like that's something the church doesn't need to be involved in. And what they end up doing is making it seem like nine times out of 10 that Christian conservatives who do care about these things are hyper extreme, while Christians who are on the left are actually not. They're the normal ones. That's what they do. They never say, hey, it's actually pretty extreme that you guys want to police speech 
You know, like I'm not really into the policing speech. I'm not really into the like the getting the drag queens and the Germans to come into America, paying a German firm to come and teach us better media literacy. Are you serious? From Germany? <laughs> I mean, I'm not being mean. I, I love Germany and German people are awesome and I love the country, but you're you're going to get a it doesn't even matter if it's Germany. You're going to get another country. You're going to get a country less free than us to come teach our kids about media literacy, and we're going to pay for it. Nine times out of ten, what you see are, are, are preachers who say they don't want to get political, but if they were going to come down on something, they would come down against people like me, not against people that are being quiet about the Germans teaching their media literacy. You know it's true. You know it's true. Now, I'm only talking about leaders that are like, I'm not getting political. We don't talk about any of that stuff. I'm talking about that group. It's nearly impossible at this point. If you believe that, that, that the call of the church is actually, as Billy Graham said, to recognize that, that something like communism will destroy Christianity, but also it'll destroy humanity. So, and I told you earlier when I read it, I remember I said, we'll come back to humanity later. Remember, circling back at the end, I'm at the end of my story, end of my, my picture I'm painting for you. Does Christianity have a responsibility? Do Christian leaders have a responsibility to say, hey, I don't want to get involved in partisan politics and telling you who to vote for. But I do have a responsibility that if I see humanity is about to get enslaved, do I have a responsibility to say something sort of like Chattel slavery? Do, do I have a responsibility to say, hey, guys, you are literally destroying humanity by allowing chattel slavery in America. We, we can't do that. Is that Christian? And if it is Christian, then it follows that saying communism is an evil empire that wants to destroy Christianity 100% completely, annihilate it from the planet, and then enslave the rest of the planet under, under the state, the power of, of the state, that is actually not good. That will lead to the enslavement of all of humanity. We got to speak out against that. If you believe that, then it follows. Woo, we're about to hit it now. Then it follows that you would say, I don't really want to get political, but in terms of enslavement and absolute evil and absolute genocide, we do have to say the number one cause of death in America is not diabetes, it's not starvation, it's not cancer, it's not floods, it's not hurricanes, you know, it's not heart disease, it's not old age, it's abortion. We, we kill more living people in this country uh, a year than die from anything else, and that is a genocide, and I don't want to get political, I'm just saying that is so robustly evil that, that you can't actually like go in the pulpit week after week after week and never say anything about that. Do, do you see what I'm saying? And if that is what's happening, we need men who understand the times. And if you're somebody that says, look, I don't have time for that. I just want to exegete the word of God. Then I would just encourage you, then have somebody with you, whether they're on your staff, whether it's a voice that you listen to, whether it's someone that you trust who does understand the times and can say to you, hey, you know, Pastor Bob, I just want you to understand what we're dealing with, with this, this censoring of speech. This isn't a, a partisan thing. This isn't red state people picking up their guns saying, click, click, you can have my speech when you pry it for my cold, dead larynx. That's not what we're talking about. They are trying to police your speech about the faith. It will hit you in the pulpit if you don't stand against it now. And even if you don't stand against it, I think that it would be wrong for you to come down against Christians who do speak against it as if they're just a bunch of militaristic, quote-unquote, white evangelicals, Western patriarchal rednecks who want to storm the Capitol. I don't think you should do that because that's actually not really what's going on. My challenge for you, do you want to be a parent who understands the times? I hope you do. And I'm not saying you got to sit around reading this stuff day after day after day. You need to know what your kids are learning. You need to be in charge of what your kids are learning. Woo! Have a great week. Read the Bible.